Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, maybe it's um, nighttime for some of you uh, for our webinar entitled Post-Pandemic Recovery Modeling. Before I introduce our speaker for today, uh, just a few reminders again. Please keep your microphones on mute. Um, we are being recorded and at the same time, we are live streaming over YouTube. So our speaker for today is an associate professor and research fellow in the School of Economics of De La Salle University. Her research activities focus on the development of quantitative models for disaster risk and vulnerability analysis, as well as on the economic impact of natural disasters. In 2016, she was recognized by Thomson Reuters as the Philippines' promising star in economics and business for producing world-class research in her field. In 2017, she received the National Academy of Science and Technology Outstanding Young Scientist Award in the field of economics. So today, um, her lecture will, is entitled Post-Pandemic Recovery Modeling. Uh, let us all welcome Dr. Krista Daniel Yu. Good morning, everyone, and good, good morning. evening to our audience from the U.S. Welcome to the fourth Infoasis webinar series on COVID-19. Our topic for today is post-pandemic recovery planning. How do we identify critical sectors in the economy? This work is an extension of the Vulnerability Index for Post-Disaster Key Sector Prioritization, which was published back in 2014 in the Economic Systems Research Journal. The previous index was developed mainly for typhoons and geophysical hazards. This time, I'll be including two components that will account for workforce and income contributions that will help in adapting it for pandemics. This presentation is structured as follows. I'll give a brief background on the current economic landscape, provide a discussion on the methods used for analysis, a thorough discussion on the components of the sector criticality index for post-pandemic recovery planning, the case of the Philippines will be used to demonstrate how the Sector Criticality Index can help policymakers identify critical sectors for post-pandemic recovery planning. The last part will cover conclusions and recommendations for moving forward. The April 16th edition of The Economist highlights that Asia's workers cannot afford to stay home during the ECQ. A significant number of workers are on a no-work, no-pay arrangement. In the Philippines, it is estimated at around 80%, many of which are barely minimum wage earnings. A significant number of businesses have stopped operations since the ECQ. Given the, that MSMEs form 99.52% of total business enterprises, 88.45% of which are micro-enterprises, the ECQ takes a toll on their liquidity, the ability to keep their employees, the capacity to pay their loans, and ultimately continue business operations upon lifting the ECQ. My research team at De La Salle University came out with a policy brief on the economic impact of Metro Manila enhanced community quarantine, which is accessible via the link provided. This was published prior to the two-week extension, so I'll show a quick update on our results. We were able to identify initial sectors that will suffer from persistent inoperability or failure to operate as a result of the ECQ. Non-essential shops, transportation, Non-essential services, among others, are forced to stop operations. Initially unaffected sectors, such as mining and quarrying, electricity and communications, will suffer increasing levels of operability as the ECQ goes further. So, um, these... 
other sectors outside Metro Manila also offer inoperability such as agriculture, mining and quarrying, and manufacturing. Overall, the Philippine economy will lose around 616 billion pesos, accounting for direct and indirect losses. In terms of economic losses, NCR trade, manufacturing, private services, and transportation are the biggest losers, while the rest of the Philippines manufacturing sector, which was initially unaffected, also ends up as one of the biggest losers resulting from the interdependence of economic sectors. The sector criticality index is based on the Nobel Prize winning concept developed by Professor Vasily Leonti based on the interdependence of economic sectors. An input-output system can be simplified into this diagram where in, it is shown that agricultural output can be used as an input for its own production, an input for industrial sector and the services sector, and ultimately for final demand or end users. For example, agricultural output are used by food manufacturers to produce their own products. The food services sector uses agricultural inputs as an output as an input to their services. End users also use their products for their own consumption. Overall, these are considered the economic output of each sector. The sector criticality index is composed of five components which are derived from the input-output framework. The economic impact component is a combination of output multiplier and the inoperability multiplier. The second component is a measure of economic distance. The third component accounts for the sector's contribution to the entire economy. The fourth component is represented by the income multiplier. And the fifth component accounts for the number of employed by the sector. Each component is computed for each sector. So if we have an 11 sector economy, we will have 11 SCI values. The first component is economic impact. This accounts for the impact of infusion of funds to the economy after an extreme event. The ratio between the output multiplier and the inoperability multiplier is used to compute both. The output multiplier accounts for the gains, while the inoperability multiplier accounts for the risks of each sector. When the output multiplier is greater than the inoperability multiplier, there are higher gains relative to lost output for every peso invested into the sector. When the output multiplier is less than the inoperability multiplier, the gains from the investment is not sufficient to recover losses for the reduction in final demand. The second component, connectivity, is computed using the average propagation length. It accounts for the economic distance between two sectors, which includes size and dependence. It measures the average number of steps it takes a demand pool in industry J to affect production in, in sector I. So to illustrate this, we, here is a table of average propagation length for a six sector economy. It is shown that the demand pool of the manufacturing sector from mining takes two steps. But where does this pass through? So, based on the table, um, mining to services takes one step. So, it's shown here. And then, 
services to manufacturing takes another step shown here by this arrow. So that illustrates that the connection between mining and manufacturing passes through the services sector. Oops. Sorry. Let me try to erase that. So, for the fourth component, we have the income multiplier, which shows the household income generated by an additional peso or final demand for a sector's output. This will then increase demand for other sectors' output, causing a ripple effect. The fifth component is employment for each sector, which provides a measure or which is measured by the number of persons employed. This measure shows the number of people dependent on the specific sector for livelihood. Overall, the sector criticality index is a weighted sum of five components discussed. Economic impact, connectivity, sector size, income multiplier, and employment. To ensure that the SCI achieves desirable properties of an index, which are proportionality, circularity, determinate, dimensionless, and reversible, normalization method is implemented for each component. This ensures that results are consistent and compatible. The Philippines is taken as our case study to demonstrate the use of the SCI for analysis. The multipliers are based on the 2012 Philippine Input-Output Table, which is the most recent published by the Philippine Statistics Authority. For ease of presentation, I'll be using a, an 11-sector table. Although for more detailed analysis, then this can be disaggregated further to isolate specific sectors of interest. For example, the transportation, communication, and storage sector can be disaggregated further to isolate the air transportation sector if that is the sector of interest. Employment data is based on the January 2020 release of the Labor Force Stati Survey published by the Philippine Statistics Authority. So on this slide, I have a table that shows for the base case, um, I assume equal weight among the five components. It can be noted that for each component, a sector may exhibit different that for each component, a sector, the manufacturing sector has a low score in terms of economic impact. So let me try to mark that here. Compared to all other sectors. However, if we look at the connectivity and the sector size and compare it with the other sectors, you can see that it has a relatively high score. Based on the equal weight assumption, the most critical sector for recovery are the mining sector, uh, sorry, the manufacturing sector, the private services sector, the trade sector, and the agriculture, fishery, and forestry sectors. And then 
the dots here show the rank of each sector. So the lower number that we have, the higher, the more important it is. For example, manufacturing uh, is ranked number one and so on. So this slide and the next slide will show um, visualization of the rankings. So instead of looking at them all together, you can look at each sector and how it's ranked based on each of the components that we discussed earlier. So the sector with the smallest area um, it, within the polygon gives the highest in, um, the score. So for example, in this slide, the smallest polygons are manufacturing and agriculture, fishery, and forestry. While we can see that the larger or less critical sectors in terms of rankings are um, electricity, gas, and water, and the mining and quarrying sector. So, for this slide, we have the trade sector, which has the smallest area, and the private services sector. So, what you can see here is, for some components, like the economic impact, um, the ranking of that sector may not necessarily be high. But in terms of other components like employment, income of the supplier, sector size, and connectivity, these sectors rank high compared to the others. Another sector worth looking into is the government services sector, where we see that in terms of economic impact and income multiplier, it ranks very high. Or, okay. But in terms of connectivity and sector size, it is one of the lowest. That's why it is not part of the priority sectors. So, we, given that policymakers have different ways of assigning weights to each component, I've implemented a sensitivity analysis. So it can be seen in this graph that um, the manufacturing and private services sector consistently have the highest SCI values, followed by the trade sector and closely by the agricultural, fishery, and forestry sector. The trade, communications, and storage, and finance sector have similar values. And the electricity, gas, and water, and construction sectors also have similar values. The real estate and ownership of dwellings have the lowest values. For government services, it can be seen that it has broad variations. So sometimes it assumes values on the level of the manufacturing sector, but there are times that it has low values. So if we look at the rankings, we can conclude that the manufacturing and private services sector consistently are the top sectors, followed by the trade sector. The real estate and ownership of dwelling sector consistently ranks lowest or 11. 
the construction and electricity, gas, and water um, consistently ranks from 6 to 10 or are the lower priority sectors. The transportation, communication, and storage, finance, and mining and quarrying sector rank, assume the ranks from 4 to 10, 9 most of the time, and these are mid-priority sectors along with the agricultural sector. And lastly, the government services sector has broad variations. That's why it sometimes has a top priority or all the way up to the 10th rank. So uh, we cannot conclude that government services is either a low priority sector or a high priority sector. So to conclude, the SCI is a prioritization index for post-pandemic recovery planning that accounts for five components, economic impact, connectivity, sector size, income multiplier, and employment. These measures are based on the foundations of the input-output model, ensuring that they are theoretically sound and captures the interdependence between economic sectors. Results may vary depending on policymakers' preference structure. However, we can we have major takeaways like manufacturing, private services, and trade sectors are clearly the leading critical sectors, followed by agriculture, even if we account for the, the variations. To sum up, here are some recommendations for the different sectors. Businesses have to be ready for the new normal. After the pandemic, businesses, business practices and consumer behavior will no longer be the same. People will be more aware of social distancing and disinfection. And there will be a surge in online activity, so online transactions will be the new norm. Doing your groceries online was initially unthinkable, but now is the norm. There is a huge potential in urban agriculture. While it is impossible for urban agriculture to replace traditional farmlands, the ECQ has highlighted the high dependence of Metro Manila, among others, for food coming in from regions. Increase in budget allocation for research and development, specifically science and technology health industries, among others. Policymakers need to realize that research does not happen in a day. We need to invest as a country to build a culture of research in order to improve our capability to respond to the needs of society. Currently, R&D budget for the Philippines is less than 1%. We have been left behind by our ASEAN peers. Based on our research culture now, we are trained to fight yesterday's wars. Instead, we need to change this so that we can fight or we can prepare for the next Black Swan event. Global recession means decline in exports, including services. Industries such as the semiconductor industry need to watch out for possible decline in trade. Global trade is seen to be to reduce by 5% according to the IMF. In addition, our high reliance on, um, on our service export or OFWs will make the Philippines highly vulnerable 
two layoffs that will happen abroad. For example, um, with the cruise ships being a high mo mo high mode of transfer for the COVID during the COVID scenario, people being stuck at sea, there will be lower demand for cruise cruises, and this would cause layoffs for our OFWs. New financial products should be introduced. So new risks open the market to new types of products in the sectors of life insurance and non-life insurance. In particular, for the Philippines, we don't have much products on that will cover businesses should there be a forced closure as a result of something like the ECQ. Loan restructuring and payment plans need to be reassessed. As a result of pandemics, there will be layoffs, stock operations. Re definitely, people will have difficulty paying back their loans. So the financial sector have, has to be prepared to cover these, um, these defaults. So the possibility of restructuring loans and adjusting payment plans should be on the table. Maximize the benefit of low petroleum prices. So the other day, the oil prices went as low as negative so levels. And we should harness this benefit or opportunity in order to lower our cost of energy production and as well as assure, ensuring that we have stable energy supply. Facilitate work from home arrangements. So our telecommuting act has been in place since 2018, but not many firms have been taking advantage or allowing their employees to work from home. With the current situation, these firms have allowed or has sped up the, their adoption of such arrangements. So we should be more prepared in being flexible. Also, we have to be creative in reimagining possible scenarios. We should harness the possible the power of digital connectivity, which will um, expand the horizons of transactions. Also, um, online transactions will be the new thing and we all have to learn it. Um, and lastly, change is inevitable. So the, um, the incapability of adapting change will render some sectors or some firms non-competitive, which will cause them to lose clients. So we should be open to change. And this ends my discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Krista. Uh, but before we proceed to the questions, I just want to say again that th this webinar is being hosted by the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. So this is an organization of scientists and engineers of Philippine descent. Initially, they were based in the Philippines and the U.S., but now we have expanded to other countries as well. So, okay, so with that, um, I will go through the different questions that have been given th through our chat, and we have about 100 viewers in our YouTube um, live streaming. So we will also take those into consideration. So I think that this um, topic is really very timely. I think it is in, um, it is something that we really need to think about as we uh, endure the impacts of this pandemic. So our first question comes from Denny. Uh, how do you actually determine the connectivity between the different industries? 
Okay. Good morning, Denny. So, um, your question goes to, I think, the second component of the index, which is the average propagation length or the measure of the economic distance. So, what we do is, um, what I did was to add the column sums and take, wait, um, let me just go back to the slide. If you're interested, so here. Okay. So, for example, we are interested in the manufacturing sector. And mining sector. So, what I did here was to add the sum of the row. So the pen won't show, but so for the mining and quarrying sector, one, then just take the sum and then the sum here and then subtract this two times so that you can account for the connectivity across different sectors. And then we normalize. Okay, thank you for that. So we just want to recognize that Denny is actually the Dean of Engineering at Harriet Watt um, in Malaysia. So thank you, Denny, for joining us this morning. Um, the next question comes from Danilo Cortez. Um, why is the tourism sector not identified? Is it considered part of private services or is it a non-essential industry? Um, it is part of private services. It, um, however, um, currently it is a non-essential industry. That's why it's one of those that closed down. However, we recognize that the tourism sector is a major driver of growth. That's why the social amelioration plans should include the tourism sector. So another possible recommendation is for government to target um, the businesses that are heavily affected by the ECQ, such as the tourism industry, because that way they can maintain their employees as much as possible we want to reduce unemployment or the number of layoffs that will result from this so there should be an incentive for keeping people employed thank you for your question okay thank you for that another one from our audience it says fortman klein but i suppose that's um a company so i'm assuming it's from mr gary cheng um how might one envisage a scenario where the weightings are different you mentioned that different policy makers might be assigning different types of weights so if you're really interested in um looking at the weights i mean a specific policy makers weighting scheme there should be an interview conducted however um, in this presentation what i did was to do a monte Carlo simulation which accounts for different levels of variation so somehow we are able to simulate or account for different types of policy makers waiting schemes Okay, thank you. Maybe just a follow up on that. Uh, the sensitivity analysis that you um, mentioned or you showed a while ago, um, where were the variations or what type of uh, changes were um, implemented so that the sensitivity can be um, assessed? Yeah, Krista, you're um, muted. Can you please unmute? Can you rephrase the question again? Oh, sorry. Okay, just as a follow-up, since um, it's possible that there might be different weights, you mentioned a while ago that you also performed sensitivity analysis. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you integrated uh, variations in weights in that sensitivity. So if not, um, what actually uh, were the parameters varied in that um, assessment? Okay, so um, 
each for each uh, component i allowed the variation to span from one to from zero to one and then to ensure that they all add up to one i normalized them so that um, for some cases the for example the component one can have a very low weight compared to the others for some scenarios component five can have very high weight and so on. So it allowed for different types of variations and they, these were all random based on the Monte Carlo, the, the definition of Monte Carlo simulation. So um, it's quite broad. Okay, thank you. Um, let's take one question from our YouTube viewers. So it's from Angeline Lau. How is time accounted for in the model? Will, with the further extension of the ECQ, how do you think it will affect uh, the results of the model? So for this model, it is a static type of um, analysis. So it does not account for time. However, in the previous model that I showed you, I, or the policy brief that I presented in the first part, um, it accounts for time. So that one was expanded until um, ECQ until April 3rd. Okay, thank you. Another question from um, our viewers in, our, in the YouTube. What do you think is the impact of the ECQ extension on the results of the model? Again, um, it's not, it does not account for the extension. It just helps us identify, based on the five components, how government should prioritize the specific sector. For more details on time and extension of the ECQ, we should be exploring the other model that we that my team has developed, which is the persistent inoperability in productive model. Okay, thank you. So a question so, from I think much of the um, interest is on the time component. So let me just move okay. to the to the screen where we have the link to our previous one. Okay, thank you. So one question from Cindy. So a while ago you mentioned that the construction will be one of the industries that will be opened under the new ECQ um, guidelines. Sorry, is this an example of what you said that weights may vary depending on how policymakers assign them? Yes, it is a possibility. So. Um, if we look at the component, a specific component, probably construction sector ranks relatively high. One question again from uh, the YouTube. It's from ML Kersostomo. Uh, do you think there's a group in the Philippines beyond the IATF which can actually pick up from the recommendations you have presented here so that they can drive actions? Mm, I think it should be the IATF who will who are driving the policies here in the Philippines. So maybe they are the proper body to uh, listen to our recommendations. Yeah, I hope that some of our, uh, maybe some of our participants who are are viewing YouTube and maybe joining in this uh, Zoom webinar, uh, me, you can um, communicate with Dr. Krista Yu even after this webinar if you want to get further insights. Okay, next question from Mr. Jerry Victorio. Given the fiscal and monetary stimulus being implemented by the Philippine government, will this be able to minimize the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and up to what extent? That is a very good question that is beyond the scope of this presentation and I think it is part of future work if we need to optimize. Dr. Katina Visa is actually our optimization expert. So um, we have to develop a study on that. Okay. Um, yeah, it was a follow-up. The Philippines has the lowest stimulus package in the world. Will a targeted sector selection program help? Definitely. So, uh, targeting sectors that will 
give the highest return based on connectivity will help um, increase the impact of very limited resources. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, another question from the YouTube comments. Um, can you, is it possible to illustrate personal financial model for individuals generally citing different income variants of people? I suppose, is it possible to um, integrate like variations in income um, with the uh, possible impact of, um, yeah, the pandemic? Hello, Krista. Hello. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. It it becomes very difficult to account for variations in income level, but it is possible by um, probably giving weights on the employment returns. Like, if we have information of how much each person receives, for example, um, agriculture has a relatively low wage compared to other sectors, so. If we include that in our, if we have information on that and include that in component five, probably we could account for variations. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Jean Depano. What do you think um, the international NGOs should prioritize in terms of supporting the Philippine recovery plan and um, transition to the new normal? Um, by international NGOs, do you mean World Bank and IMF? So, um, yeah, it was so, not cited, but uh, I, I suppose we can assume that. Yeah, probably, uh, well, each country has their own landscape and um, accounting for the proper adaptation scale, uh, proper sectoral landscape here in the Philippines. The, NG, the international NGOs cannot, um, cannot apply the same measures as they do in other countries, but um, they also have, have to look into the models on how fit they are, their, uh, their aid would come in. To the Philippines. Okay, um, another one from RG Reyes. Uh, generally, which among the sectors can take the lead into economic recovery? So, based on our findings, um, there are three key sectors manufacturing, private services, and trade. So, these are the sectors that government should look into. And by private services, there are a number of certain, um, sectors covered, like hotels and restaurants, accommodation, um, tourism industry, and the like. Creative industries are also good. Okay, uh, another question from Danilo. Um, is it possible to include risk and severity assessment as one of the sector criticality index before reactivating a specific sector? Sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Um, is it possible to include risk and severity assessment as one of the sector criticality index before reactivating a specific sector? Maybe it's about yeah relating uh, risk and uh, severity with the uh, proposed criticality index. So it is possible. Um, it can be part of the first component, or it can be introduced as a new component. That, yeah, depending on or it can actually come in as a weight. So if you feel that severity severity is yeah. Um, very important, then higher weight should be given there. 
Okay, uh, we have another one from YouTube, from the YouTube comments. Um, for the Philippine data uh, of PSA, the, the most recent one is in 2012. Are there new factors that may affect the results for periods after 2012 until 2019? So, the change in technology will be one of the key differences that can be can that will be different from 2012 but um, for example um, technology doesn't really change so much pre pandemic but after the pandemic definitely um, change so much change will happen for example um, for VPOs uh, that they typically have communication services um, in the office. But as a result of their work from home arrangements, the communication sector, the communication demand becomes the household demand rather than a sectoral demand. So um, these changes across different sectors will be the main difference that um, we won't be able to account for given the current um, data structure. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's it for our comments. Uh, maybe I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you think we should, um, what do you think we should do right after the ECQ? I'm sure we need to uh, somehow return back to our new normal or normal operations. So, we just have to be more open on new possibilities, new ways of operating things. So probably, um, it, yeah, like what I earlier mentioned, going to malls used to, used to be everyone's leisure activity. Now um, we, come, we become more cautious towards going out and uh, mall, but, Mall tenants need to be prepared for the decline in demand. So these are the things that we need to be prepared for once things go back to normal or once ECQ is lifted. Okay, thank Transportation you. also is another okay, thing yeah. that um, we need to look into. For example, um, a common practice is filling up all the jeeps until everyone is cramped. But with social distancing and people becoming more aware, we need to become, we need to adapt or jeepney drivers need to account for that lost cost and lost income. So um, either there will be an increase in um, transportation costs. So or um, the design of the jeep will be different. Or, so change is really a big factor. Okay, thank you for that. Um, but before we close, um, uh, do you have any other um, final statements before we close the webinar? Thank you all for your time. And uh, like my last recommendation, change is inevitable. So we all need to adapt and be more open. I think that's the new thing that we need to learn from the current situation. Okay, but before we close, let me plug our next webinar. So we're doing the webinar every Friday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, so next week, it will be a continuation of um, the presentation today. Um, Next week, we have Professor Juice Santos from George Washington University to talk about reflections on the impact of flatten the curve on interdependent workforce sectors. So if you're interested, please register at bit.ly um, slash JR Santos. Um, I'll be sending you a link to the registration portal uh, for this particular webinar. So, okay. Hold on. Hold on, hold on.
sorry, I think, uh, <laughs> okay, I wasn't able to share it properly. Okay, so this is the, the poster for our next um, webinar next week. It's Professor Juice Santos from George Washington University. And I think he's in the audience right now. <laughs> so um, that's it. So I hope you can join us again um, next week. Okay, so with that, we're closing the session. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we will be uploading the recording also on YouTube. So thank you and good morning.